What if the human genome, the most studied code in modern science, still hides a secret capable of rewriting an entire people's origin story? Not a myth, not a legend, a truth buried in bones, carbon, and mitochondrial strands older than every empire that claimed to define history. The story begins in 2022, when archaeologists opened the earth beneath a medieval warehouse in Erfurt, Germany. Inside the darkness lay a forgotten Jewish cemetery sealed since the 14th century. Thirty-three skeletons, untouched by time, lay waiting. The Black Death had taken them abruptly, freezing their genetic story at a single moment, like an insect trapped in amber. Those remains would become the most important window into Jewish genetic history ever discovered. When the genomes were sequenced, the results shook everything historians assumed about the Ashkenazi Jewish past. Modern Ashkenazi Jews, today numbering around 11 million, descend from a tiny ancestral group of perhaps 350 to 500 people, a founder event so extreme it is almost a biological impossibility. Imagine trying to build a city using only the bricks that survived a fire. Every wall, every tower, every home must be made from those same few pieces. Over centuries, the structure becomes larger, more complex, but the DNA, the original bricks, remain the same. But the real shock wasn't the size of the group, it was who they were. On the paternal side, the story was clear. The Y chromosomes carried unmistakable Middle Eastern signatures, J, E, and other Levantine haplogroups that traced directly to ancient Judeans and to modern Palestinian, Druze, and Mizrahi populations. These lineages ring with geographic precision. They point to the Levant so sharply that scientists sometimes call them genetic compass needles. But the maternal ancestry refused to match. The mitochondrial DNA, passed only from mothers, did not point to the Levant, the Fertile Crescent, or anywhere in ancient Israel. Instead, it pointed thousands of miles away into prehistoric Europe, long before Judaism, Rome, Greece, or even the earliest Hebrew tribes. Four maternal lineages dominate the Ashkenazi mtDNA pool. K1A1B1A, K1A9, K2A2A1, and N1B. These lineages appear in almost no Middle Eastern populations. They belong to women who lived among early European hunter-gatherers and early farming cultures long before the first Hebrew prayers were spoken. These were mothers who never saw Jerusalem, never kept kosher, never heard the words of the Torah, yet their mitochondrial signatures now run through millions of Ashkenazi descendants. Early studies suggested the possibility. Later studies confirmed it. Richards, Costa, Waldman, independent teams across a decade of research all arrived at the same conclusion. The mtDNA of Ashkenazi Jews is overwhelmingly European in origin, not medieval European, not Roman European, prehistoric European. How did this happen? How did a people whose paternal roots are grounded in the ancient Middle East inherit nearly half of their maternal ancestry from women who lived thousands of years earlier in Europe? The answer leads back to the Roman Empire. Between the 1st and 4th century CE, Jewish communities lived across Italy. Merchants, scholars, laborers, and traders from Judea settled throughout the Mediterranean after the destruction of the Second Temple. These men brought with them their traditions and laws, but they also encountered a world where conversion to Judaism, especially among women, was surprisingly common. Roman writers mention it often. Imperial edicts even attempted to limit Jewish proselytizing because so many women were joining the community. Some of these women married Jewish men, some adopted Jewish life voluntarily. Their mtDNA carried silently through each daughter became the seed of a new population, Jews of mixed Near Eastern and European ancestry. Not through coercion, not through conquest, 
through families, through love, partnership, community, and faith. As generations passed, these families moved northward. By the early Middle Ages, they reached the Rhine Valley, the birthplace of Ashkenazi culture. They carried Near Eastern paternal ancestry and European maternal ancestry, a fusion of worlds, one defined by scripture, the other defined by deep prehistoric roots. Then, catastrophe and rebirth. In the early medieval period, this small population experienced an extreme bottleneck. Only hundreds of individuals contributed to nearly the entire modern Ashkenazi gene pool. Their genetic signatures, trapped by circumstance and survival, became fixed. Mutations linked to Tay-Sachs disease, Canavan disease, BRCA cancers, traits often associated with suffering, are relics of this bottleneck, not curses, histories. When the Erfurt genomes were analyzed, scientists found something astonishing. The bottleneck had already happened by the 14th century. The same founder effects seen in today's Ashkenazi Jews were fully present in those medieval remains. One woman in Erfurt carried a maternal lineage that today appears in millions. She never knew she was a founder. She never knew her genetic echo would survive plagues, crusades, migrations, and modernity. Yet her mitochondria marched through time unchanged, a silent signature of continuity. But the maternal mystery is only half the story. The paternal side held a twist of its own. Levites, an ancient Israelite priestly caste believed to descend directly from Levi, were expected to carry Middle Eastern Y chromosomes. Yet more than half of Ashkenazi Levites today carry a lineage called R1A M582. This haplogroup is not typical of the Levant. Instead, it is associated with Eastern European and Indo-Iranian populations. One man, a single male founder, entered the Levite lineage around 1,000 years ago. His descendants inherited not only his Y chromosome, but the Levite title itself, a priesthood reshaped by a single father. One of the most debated questions arises here. Could this founder have lived within the Khazar Empire, an early medieval kingdom whose ruling elite famously converted to Judaism around the 8th century? Some geneticists note that the timing of the R1A Y2619 split aligns suspiciously well with this conversion period, but without ancient Khazar DNA, the puzzle remains unsolved. No one can claim certainty. Meanwhile, autosomal DNA the blended ancestry from both parents reveals even more layers. Ashkenazi Jews are roughly one quarter to one half Southern European in ancestry, primarily from Italy and Greece. Not medieval Europe, not German lands, the Mediterranean. This means the European ancestry entered early, long before the population reached Northern Europe. Even the Yiddish language retains clues. Its vocabulary is Germanic, but its grammar contains Slavic skeletons. Some linguists propose earlier contact with Iranian and Turkic languages. A 2016 study even suggested its origins may lie along ancient Silk Road trade routes near modern Turkey. Though debated, the idea reflects one truth. Ashkenazi identity did not emerge in isolation. It was forged through movement, trade, adaptation, and diaspora. Despite all these layers, one question hovers above the story like a shadow. Who were those prehistoric European women whose mitochondrial lines define so much of modern Ashkenazi ancestry? Imagine one of them. She lived 7,500 years ago, perhaps in a forested valley of Neolithic Europe, she was part of an early farming culture, tending land, raising children, watching seasons turn. She never saw the Mediterranean, never imagined Rome or Jerusalem. She lived before writing, before metal, before the stories that would shape Western civilization. Yet her mitochondria survived everything that came after. 
They traveled through millennia of migration and demographic change. They passed into Roman families, then into Jewish families. They journeyed north to the Rhine, east to Poland, west to France, south to Italy. They hid during pogroms, whispered through ghettos, endured famine, war, genocide, and rebirth. Her life is lost, but her cells survived. Somewhere along the centuries, one of her distant descendants joined a Jewish community through marriage or conversion. Her daughters carried the faith. Her daughter's daughters carried the mitochondria. And through the relentless arithmetic of a population bottleneck, her lineage became dominant. She is now one of the four ancestral mothers of millions. And this is where the story becomes not just scientific, but human. Identity is not a genome. It is a narrative carried across generations. A people is not built from purity, but from survival, from accepting newcomers, from families formed across boundaries and continents. The discovery of deep European maternal ancestry does not erase Jewish identity. It illuminates it. It shows a people that grew not through isolation, but through connection. A people that absorbed outsiders who chose to join them, who took their place within a community defined not by blood, but by history, culture, and belief. The earthfort bones remind us of something else. Identity can be both fragile and eternal. Those individuals died during one of the darkest plagues in history. Their community was wiped out. They left no written records in that moment of despair but their DNA lived. The genome remembers what history forgets. Every mutation is a footprint, every lineage a whisper, every haplogroup a path through time. If you're enjoying this story, you can support the channel simply by subscribing. It helps bring hidden truths like this back to life. By the time the Earthfort community perished in 1349, the Ashkenazi people had already taken their shape. Their ancestry already blended continents and epochs. Their genome held the signatures of mothers and fathers separated by time, geography, and culture, yet united by the unpredictable force of history. The last subscription reminder fits naturally here. If stories like this move you, join us. What remains in the end is this. Identity is not singular, it is a mosaic, a tapestry, a cathedral of memory built stone by stone over thousands of years. The genome does not tell us who we are, it tells us where our stories began. The rest is written by the choices of those who came after. In the silence of ancient bones, we hear echoes of a people shaped by worlds they no longer remember carrying lineages older than their own name and surviving every darkness to tell their story again.